My name is Lucas Evers. I work for uh, WAG, uh, Technology and Society in Amsterdam, and I'm super grateful to uh, to be one of the project partners in Hybrid Lab Network project uh, with such great partners here in Portugal, in Ljubljana and in Helsinki. Uh, I will, um, yeah, have a conversation with three uh, great people here. Um, Marta Vos Mendes, I hope you, um, uh, I hope you, I pronounce your name well. We met once during Biohack Academy in Amsterdam. And uh, Louise McKenzie, who is also an artist and researcher at Newcastle University. And um, Professor José Bessa, which is fantastic to have here because uh, during Hybrid Lab Network, I collaborated a lot with you. However, uh, um, uh, under COVID restrictions, it's only the second time that we meet. Um, we're here to to share a couple of uh, the experience, the experiences we had during uh, over the course of the, the uh, activities and research of Hybrid Lab Network. Um, and uh, it is uh, Louise who has present who has prepared a little presentation, but also myself, as I also uh, have been involved in uh, quite. Uh, a number of the so-called learning, teaching, and training activities, the LTTAs, as part of the project. So, um, the first LTTA was actually organized by um, I3S here. And uh, I think it's important to, to say what we did there. Uh, uh, it was a... Um, uh, Hack the LTTA was the name, so it was a couple of hackathons. And what we did in uh, with the group in Amsterdam, which, by the way, uh, was entirely online because we had the the, the huge difficulty, the huge hindrance of uh, the COVID pandemic uh, breaking out soon after the start of the project. And um, I still want to say how enormously productive the consortium still has acted uh, uh, despite these hindrances. Uh, in Amsterdam, the team uh, worked on uh, creating an idea of how you can uh, work with a genetic modification technique called uh, CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, and how it is interesting to, to uh, try to engage a broader audience, but also artists uh, in there. It was all done online, so it was a, a, a type of an ideation uh, uh, workshop that we did to make a kind of uh, format, how you can do that. And we, um, we thought of a couple of um, uh, elements, so going from an exhibition to open the minds, to go to teaching and learning the fundamentals of how you apply uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technique in an artistic and creative context, how you go to speculation, what you can do um, uh, otherwise with that than uh, what uh, normal scientific research would do, and then eventually go into um, uh, a project team to do the things itself. However, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 also has a lot of restrictions because of um, biosafety reasons. And then sharing all the results back and to go into the cycle anew. So that was the first LTTA. The second LTTA um, uh, was really doing uh, the thing itself. So uh, in um, our non-scientific bio lab in Amsterdam, we had the uh, the interesting case of a couple of artists, Günther Seyfried, uh, Ro uh, Roland van Dierendonk, and uh, an Italian uh, biotech researcher, Federico Moffato, doing um, a cell-free experiment, uh, trying to use CRISPR technique in order to uh, change an image, in this case an image of a bull um, that symbolizes the cradle of... Um, um, agriculture in um, in the Iraqi area uh, current days. Um, I'm not going to go into the technique itself, but we reenacted, we remade the technique under their guidance, but also with a lot of help of uh, José Bessa here uh, present and others uh, to to learn the technique by doing this artwork 
again uh, in the labs in Helsinki and uh, here in I3S and in Amsterdam. And by the way, the Amsterdam lab was the least successful, but um, um, the third one um, was also uh, very special because the whole um, uh, hybrid lab network team came to Amsterdam uh, to learn more during uh, a broader program that is uh, um, uh, given over a course of 10 weeks in Amsterdam called the Biohack Academy, within which uh, there were also a couple of modules that were specifically oriented at uh, the work we do in uh, hybrid lab network. Here you see a couple of images and on the um, uh, left side for you, you see one of the outcomes, which is a, uh, an artist-made uh, portable um, cabinet to uh, exhibit um, in all biosafety me measures uh, uh, biological artworks that work with genetic modification. So that's a little bit uh, the, the uh, activities we did uh, in Amsterdam that I was very much involved with. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, and also related to um, the, the presentation we just had um, of Claudia, I think it's very interesting to see what we all learned and how to take that further and maybe even beyond um, the, the, the idea and the frame of uh, uh, STEAM education and to involve communities, because that is actually what is in the interest of WAG. Uh, I think if you look at um, the way you combine these uh, uh, epistemological approaches in art and science, you also do it for something. And I think it's very interesting to, to think of that context uh, and that's a societal context. There's a lot of concern around these technologies of citizens, but there's also uh, um, yeah, a lot of next steps to be taken where you can combine uh, communities, um, artistic and creativity uh, in such uh, a context, and also working with uh, the, the knowledge that is uh, produced by, by academia. Therefore, I want to... Uh, um, say quickly this about uh, this notion we are developing uh, on mattering. Huh? Science produces matters of fact. Uh, within a context, these become matters of interest, uh, politics, uh, um, uh, industry uh, interests. But uh, communities have their matters of concern uh, that if you combine these and you're open about them, where steam can help a lot, these could become matters of care. There I want to leave our experiences of WAG, and I would, uh, um, and, and sorry I was the first one, uh, but I would love to, uh, to give the word to um, Louise McKenzie, who has a short presentation, uh, and then uh, Jose and Marta don't have presentations, but we'll go into a conversation about yeah, what we learned from this and how to bring it further. So please um, give an applause to Louise McKenzie. Okay, so hi everyone, and thanks for welcoming me to this um, this conference today. Um, when we agreed to have this roundtable initially, I thought it was just going to be conversations. However. Um, Lucas asked us if we had anything to, that we could bring in terms of ways of presenting. And actually, the work that, that I took part in, as part, which was also part of the, um, the hybrid lab hackathons, I was in a different group to Lucas. And um, I worked with uh, Dr. Anna Olson, who is here somewhere, I believe. Um, there she is. <laughs> um, and together, we worked with Polona Tratnik, who is also here, and um, uh, a number of the other members of the group to develop a, a, an interdisciplinary uh, course, a short course uh, called Alive Together, which focused on looking at human-animal relationships. I coming at it from my perspective as an artist, Anna coming at it from her perspective as an ethologist and a scientist studying animal behavior, Polona with her um, philo philosophical perspective on the non-human, and we invited many others obviously to contribute as well. We actually presented this work at a conference, ISAS, and so 
I have a short video uh, from that, so I'm going to stop talking now and play it. It's about um, eight, just over eight minutes long. Together is a global community of interdisciplinary researchers with a shared passion for the study of human, animal, and multi species relationships formed with the support of the Hybrid Lab Network. The rationale behind Alive Together was to develop a methodology and toolkit for interdisciplinary working that focused on human animal relationships. Our firm belief was that the translation of science into art should not be the goal, but rather the mutual understanding of human, animal and multi-species relationships through the different lenses that the perspectives of art, science and humanities can bring. Art is sometimes employed as a tool to illustrate objects as perceived or processes as described. Whilst this use of art in service to science can be invaluable in an explanatory capacity, often the situated perspective of the observer is lost. And further, this approach forgoes the capacity of art as critical tool. Artists can use their craft to challenge the status quo, to look beyond depiction and use their imaginative capacities to consider perspectives less readily seen or understood. Over a two week period in November and December of 2020, 17 international participants, including artists, ethologists, and zoologists and humanities scholars, came together online for the short course Alive Together One. Lectures across each of the disciplines, including from award-winning artist Maya Smrekar and novelist Daisy Hilliard, provided a framework in which participants could test out strategies in the following exercises. Uh, and this book gives us an introduction to how to quantify behaviour, how to build an ethogram, that is a catalogue of, of behaviours, and different observations and recording methods. Sampling methods, whether to focus on individual animals, whether to focus on uh, individual behaviours, or wh whether to focus on time periods. Here she is looking at the closed door. I really wanted to interpret this as her looking at my reflection, and I swear we do have these interactions. However, I believe it is a closed door she is focusing on at this point in time. Exercises such as mamalogues drew from collage and bricolage art methodologies to encourage scholars to find ways to bring their differing perspectives together. Case studies to exemplify the Alive Together methodology these works move beyond the depiction of scientific information using strategies such as empathy and anthropomorphism to reveal that the human, as much as the animal, is a species within what theorist Donna Haraway has described as nature culture. What we present here is work in progress, as all three teams have decided to continue to work on their respective projects. And so I suppose some of the ideas for this experiential installation came from the insights in phenomenological research and also contemplative science and cognitive science. And yeah, the understanding that connecting with one's inner landscapes and our range of modalities um, as humans can allow us to, to meet the world more fully. Right now you're alone, being mostly a solitary creature. And yet this is not a silent place. From miles away to the north, you hear the song of a male. And then another, and another. Melodious moans and groans on grand scales. A long, complex chorus. you brought us back home with a capital H because it was both going back to the liquid inside your mother's womb and going back home to the primordial 
um, beginning of life where it was it was in the water. We were all in the water. So amazing. Thank you very much. I really felt like I was going back to a, a space I didn't even know existed anymore. As part of the instructions for cultivating a compassionate mind, please generate a genuine aspiration for the positive impact of your actions on the environment and welfare of all living beings. Ask yourself, what gifts is your presence and your activity bringing to the world? Invite in uncomfortability. Allow for radical surprise of the unknown to enter your field of consciousness. Allow for rites of passage that establish trust and communion with your animal kin. Embrace an intimate collaboration in being complementary to each other in your differences. Uh, so our uh, cooperation was so fruitful uh, that we decided to create a toolkit uh, that will be a part of a book uh, in which we will include also all the uh, parts of our uh, exercises. Welcome to the Red House. I'm sure you are curious to know something about the lives of rats. I was born three days ago, along with my 11 siblings. My mother was crying and her stress pheromones started to talk for her. In 18 days, I will be separated from her. Oh yes, I smelled that my life had an expiration date, even before I was born. I am death, death in millions. I traveled on your ships. My persistent immune system keeps me alive with the bacteria, the virus, my mighty travelers, contamination of all histories, your black fingerprints all over my image. Was this, was this unavoidable? Did you have to be so close to us? I think uh, that you live amongst us. So we are together where you are, I am. You said that you felt safe yeah. and I see vulnerability in, in a rat for the very first time. There is a different attitude that humans have towards them. Our biggest hope is next time you run into a rat, maybe you ask yourself this question. What is this rat thinking, feeling? How is this life? Thank you. So I'd just add to that that as with um, the workshop that Lucas was involved in, obviously those all happened online as well. And I think to have those three groups that comprised artists, scientists and humanities scholars all working um, together online to come up with their individual projects. We were, we were very pleased to see the results of those. So thank you. Oh yeah, I just have to push once. Yeah, uh, thank you, Louise. That was fantastic because it also uh, uh, contained some images of how we did a lot of work online which was very, very difficult. Yeah. Yet at the same time, it, there was also a, little, a lot of creativity involved to make that work together because the, 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 the my spaces uh, would have been very different if we would have done so uh, um, without the COVID hindrances. Um, Marta, can you tell something about your experience in this project? So, hi. Uh, Thank you for inviting me for this uh, roundtable. Um, my experience within the, the hybrid was uh, 
um, as a monitor as a, uh, in, in, in the workshops and also as a participant, uh, particularly in the workshop that was organized at the Biohack Academy. Uh, I was challenged uh, at, at the beginning to, to um, so I work in microbiology. And my, my main research interest is uh, within the molecular microbiology field. And I have uh, some experience, a lot of experience, within uh, the CRISPR, Cas9 technology, uh, manipulating in vivo. So I was challenged to uh, try to uh, build uh, a protocol um, using CRISPR Cas9 uh, to uh, able to be performed or in the lab uh, by several st by students for people from different areas. So uh, my first my main difficulty at the beginning was to um, so just a, a parenthesis I'm a very pragmatic person. <laughs> I come from the science field, so uh, I have I do not uh, I do not tend to 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 philosophy uh, a lot. So my first difficulty um, uh, was to um, within the, the the by deconstructing the first difficulty was to deconstruct the protocol of CRISPR Cas9 as a monitor. So as to try to pass on the experience, try to pass on the, 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 the knowledge needed for the um, uh, uh, for the protocol. That on the other side was my main difficulty, but was my main um, the main thing that I, I I took with me as an advantage because I've learned how to maybe communicate better science with non-science people. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. We close to the mic. Uh, so, for if, if there was a difficulty, that was also an advantage for me as as a uh, outcome for me personally uh, was to um, the storytelling of the protocol, and that leads me to the storytelling workshop that I, I went to, to run. And that is what, uh, as, a, as a participant, uh, I was out of my comfort zone, but way out of my comfort zone. Uh, and that's why I, I told you that I'm a very pragmatic person. Uh, I remember that uh, there was an, a storytelling uh, exercise uh, which uh, took a couple of hours, more maybe, and I, in that uh, in that moment, I realized that the way we pass the information, the scientific information, then is transformed by the person that receives the information. In a in a in a way that, when it comes back to me, I was out. Wow. Not, uh, um, I was way out of my comfort zone. It was very, <laughs> it was very difficult. It was a very good experience for me. Uh, the, the the storytelling and and, and, the, and the days there in, in Amsterdam, because it opened up my my mind to to non science communication, communicating science through non science communication. Um, so that was an experience that I valued a lot. I thank Julio and Maria uh, Hui uh, for the invitation and for all the members of the Ivory project uh, because I, at the, and Philippe, which is my PhD student, that was for the first to talk to me about this uh, project. And um, it was a very very positive. I, now I look back and it's a very, very positive uh, experience. Yeah, uh, quickly before I go to, uh, to, to Jose, um, 
I can really imagine how much you are uh, investing in uh, understanding these type of protocols from a scientific point of view, and therefore you you um, you go so deep in it that uh, it also uh, gets um, characteristics of having difficulties going back to the general level where you can communicate. But um, uh, apparently, it is a very positive experience for you. Uh, would you like to um, repeat such a thing? Uh, are you bringing this to uh, your uh, your peers? Uh, are you sharing it? Um, how do you how does it uh, change your working now? Um, maybe I, <laughs> if I was. Well, it, the, the, the change is I'm uh, most, much careful now when I write, uh, which means that I'm even slower writing now <laughs> than it was before, because I, I tend to think and, and try to, to really pass the, 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 the message that I want. I think that's very important, the message. And if I'm going to, uh, yes, they, they, they have, uh, we have been talking of, of doing this as a, a the protocol to bring in the protocol uh, to a more practical uh, um, environment. Um, the CRISPR Cas9 protocol in the lab. Um, uh, and in my classes, I try to, to, uh, to give a the main difficulty is to, to be able to, what you said, the, the, the basic, to go back to basics and try to explain the basics. And that's very important. Um, and I think it's every area, every field has their own basics that sometimes people forget to tell the other people. And that's where we should start. Yeah, the basics. at the same time, uh, STEAM, uh, maybe has its own new basics uh, yeah. uh, in, in a certain way. So actually it's very interesting for me to see um, this uh, uh, transpose disciplinary... Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, this way. Yeah. yeah. For me it's interesting to see this trans and post disciplinary approach uh, in action in this way. So um, going over to, to, to Jose, who is... Um, has been engaged in uh, our project very much um, and is also a professor of um, um, molecular biology. Yeah, right. so. You did even much more and you helped us um, make a translation of, let's say, the artistic protocol into something that can be uh, handed over to another educational context for a broader audience but also for um, a scientific audience, understanding that if you work with CRISPR in a more creative fashion, you may come to certain other outcomes. Can you say something about your experience there? Yes, sure. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, I would like to greet you all uh, this morning. And it's really a great pleasure to, to be with you here today. And uh, yes, I can give you a little bit of my feedback on, on the, all this crazy, nuts experience that was the, the, the hybrid. So um, I was a little bit more uh, involved with the LTTA uh, 1 and 2. So LTTA meaning learning, teaching, training activity. And uh, basically, um, a, a LTTA, a LTTA uh, 1, actually I was involved in 1 and 2, and then more some uh, researchers from my lab here we have Marta and, uh, and Fabio. They are a little bit shy, but uh, they are in the audience. They also collaborated and participated also in, other, in the, the other LTTAs. So uh, my presentation in, in my, my, uh, my collaboration in one and two, one was uh, this kind of, uh, we were, it was quite a crazy um, experience to me because the, Day previous to the LTT one, I was not totally aware what you wanted. I read the manuals. I was completely in the dark, and this is so because. And uh, I mean, it's it's what 
what you were describing in this manual was it's a process, and it's a quite interesting process because it um, gives you give you the tools to start from a very uh, surface, clean surface, where the, the different contributions can put upon uh, their different contributions without uh, a previous bias. Okay, and, and that is really, really good. So we use uh, the several creativity thinking tools uh, to try to reach to uh, uh, architect or, or uh, utopian kind of uh, uh, workshop that could put together scientists and and uh, and um, artists. In my case, it was artists because the, uh, my group was a little bit more composed by my scientists and artists. And uh, it was a quite uh, interesting uh, experience, and I learned some some lessons, interesting lessons. And one of the reasons that I don't have a presentation is actually one of the lessons that I have learned. And has to do with the, the way we communicate to a broad audience, particularly when the, there's this quite diversity on the way how to process uh, ideas. And, and uh, the second thing that I have learned, putting to A and B, we, we scientists tend to do this, lists. <laughs> uh, basically, the, the second thing is that, in, in my view, I, I think that the, the artistic creative process is a little bit different from the scientific creative process. I can formulate a little bit uh, better uh, now. So um, my part or my role in, in, the, in this hybrid was to explain, so I have, uh, um, I'm a basic scientist, I work with Chris Parr, I also work with developmental biology that uh, is worried about uh, how an organism develops from an embryo to an adult. And uh, my presentation was to, um, to learn a little bit about, or teach a little bit of Chris Parr, but in the process I learned also several things. And I, I was, uh, uh, so in this process I had to explain several things, for instance, what is DNA? Because if you want to explain CRISPR, you need to explain what is DNA because CRISPR serves to mutate DNA. What is this DNA? How it encodes information? And finally, how does those, that modifications and mutations might eventually impact in an organism? Okay? This was a, quite an important challenge to me because part of it I failed completely when I tried to explain things from the basic academic uh, ground state, you know, like these basic cartoons, simplistic, where you start to simplify things, and clearly that might not be the best way how to communicate all, all these things. And uh, I think part of it, uh, as I was, what I was uh, telling you, is that um, the creative process of, of uh, an artist, and this is a scientist talking, so I can be wrong, and that could, could be a very good uh, start point for discussion, or it could be quite simplistic for you, and I apologize, I'm, I'm a very simplistic guy, sorry. But uh, uh, I think artists tend to um, start from a very blank surface, so basically, um, they speculate a lot without boundaries. Everything is possible. Pigs can fly, and uh, for a scientist, that, that is disruptive, okay? Because scientists need a framework, a framework where we base our, our previous knowledge to identify and map what is not known, and from there, we can go beyond. But we need that, that framework, that, that basis, okay? And without, without that, we are a little bit lost, okay? And the good thing about the, 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 the without boundaries kind of framework of artists is that it can help us a lot to disrupt our thinking, you know? Because sometimes, if you want to, to have new ideas about uh, biological problems, how to interpret some, uh, some already recapitulated uh, experiments, to change our interpretation from that, we really need to erase everything and uh, think again. And that is fantastic. And I'm very, very interested to, to have that from you. And it was quite a, an experience from, 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 uh, for me. For me. 
than scientists, then you need some rule. And I think that that was uh, the intervention of Claudio when he was saying, you need the textbooks and you need the, this kind of teaching because eventually, and this was very clear to me when we shift to LTTA2, that was the, uh, the, the experimental approach to science, and we need to, to go to the experimental approach because otherwise, and one of the objectives that we have is actually to define the rules of nature, okay? And for that, we need some experimental setting. And our experimental settings actually are based on previous experiments that demonstrated some rules, and we need to have that knowledge, okay? So, if you want to go to the experimental setting, you need these rules. Now, how you pass these rules to the audience, that's another challenge, and that's, that has to do with another lesson that I learned, and has to do with the, with the, the kind of uh, simplistic cartoons that we do with, with, uh, in science, okay? And um, it was, I, I can tell you this story, when we were in LTTA1, we were defining what is the best way to describe DNA, the information, and so on. I mean, for me, uh, 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 academic guy, it's a cartoon. You put A, T, G, C with a color code, and you have a codon that will give rise to an amino acid. Several amino acids will give rise to a protein. That's what you need to learn about it. When we started to think about all together in this very blank framework, how to pass this information, how can we translate this information to an audience, artists started to have this kind of, well, why don't we create the game? It's more dynamic. It's more uh, engaging for us. Why don't we do it? So, and for me, it was completely clear that showing a cartoon, as simplistic as we do, might be not the best, not the best way to engage the artists in this kind of uh, passing the information for these rules that are actually re required for to go to the experimental setting. So. So those were my two lessons that I learned a lot, and it was a quite a fantastic experience that I had with, uh, with hybrids. And uh, yeah, and if you ask me if I will do it again, yes, but I would like to have more input from you guys to help us to disrupt our, our idea. That, 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 I, I would like to have more from, from the, that part. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think I think that is um, um, what I hear from you, and and that's also what I saw in um, um, the the presentation of uh, Louise. Is uh, in the presentation of Louise, it, it, it's very interesting to see that it is not addressing. Uh, per se, uh, us as researchers of whatever kind, but it is uh, addressing an, an issue, a concern, which is uh, something that is outside the, the, the knowledge itself. Uh, that is how do we uh, enable ourselves to live better with other species on this world? Uh, broadening uh, the diversity and inclusion discussion in our societies uh, uh, to that of other species. I think that is very interesting. But it also uh, comes back to the, the, what you um, uh, tell us, uh, Jose, for who, for who is this? This is for um, a broad audience. Do we communicate science better with this uh, type of uh, uh, activities? Or do we um, enclose creativity more in science itself? And I think that is, that is two different things that um, yeah, were difficult within this project to uh, to cover uh, in its entirety because it's it's uh, quite big areas and we were just a small project. I think uh, what Maria Manuela says is is really right that we need follow up. I would um, I would say it is not true, but maybe in the in the context of the project that um, artists always start with a clean slate. I don't think that is true because um, what I learned about artistic research 
is that they can go as deep into a certain matter as scientists. However, they have one extra need, and that is to bring that back to a, a broad audience. And that is not what a science ha uh, scientist has to do. So there is a, is a, is a canvas for, for learning between the two uh, knowledge systems, uh, I would say. Um, I'm also looking at time. Uh, um, uh, I think we, we shared uh, uh, a real couple of very interesting um, uh, experiences, but also issues. Um, what would be your, your, your follow-up? Um, and then I'm going to ask all of you, what, what do you envision uh, we bring from this project to uh, possible next projects? And I want to start uh, in the opposite direction with uh, Rosena. Well, um, I, I, no, I, of course, I really you mentioned to, you want to be challenged more. Yes, yes. for sure. That, that's for sure. That, that's something that we we have uh, at least as science have uh, we we can win a lot. I I don't think I, I have extracted a set of rules. You know what, what I I have extracted maybe something. Some things that I, I was completely clear that uh, were the correct way to do it, and actually they are not. <laughs> so for, for me, I, I started with a, a predefined, more kind of uh, a format, very specific format, how to engage a broad audience, how to, to participate, how to communicate. And now I'm not totally sure that uh, that's the correct way. Actually, there are many ways to do it, and uh, cl clearly there are many different and uh, and uh, creative ways to do it. Um, I think uh, the next step for me would be to explore, and uh, it's a quite challenge to have a whiteboard for me and to communicate this this way, um, and try to experience or experiment new ways to, to approach uh, old problems, actually, old concepts on biology or genetics. Louise. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, a, a lot of what's been said here and earlier this morning, it came up in um, uh, Claudia's keynote presentation as well, um, is that I think there's a lot to be learned by both dis well, all disciplines from each other. So this idea of the scientific knowledge base that Cla Claudio mentioned being so, so deep and that you brought up that the artistic knowledge base also has that, that depth. There's a lot of technical skill in, in the artistic knowledge base as well, similarly with the humanities. And I think that there is so much that all of these disciplines can continue to learn from each other. So it works on multiple levels. There is this um, broad base of um, coming at a problem new, using critical thinking and, 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 as you've said, disrupting, looking at existing processes and finding ways to disrupt them, which I think is, is a really positive quality of this kind of way of working. And then there is also what the different disciplines can, can literally learn from each other in the deep knowledge and skills they have. So for me, what's next, um, and particularly and specifically in relation to what Anna and I uh, had been developing, is to be able to, to take that a step further. We, we ran a, a two-week pilot. I would love to be able to expand that out into a longer program where we start, and you mentioned it before, where we start from the themes and issues and questions that inspire us all, regardless of discipline. So, and those questions are around things at the moment, for example, like the climate crisis that we're in, which sit, you know, sits across all disciplinary bases. And we can find questions in these areas that inspire us all, that then unite us to work together on a challenge. The difficulty always is the funding, <laughs> because they still sit very in, in very disciplinary silos often. But yes, that's that's my next step. If I can react to that, I think there it's it's interesting to see that um, also um, uh, research funds tend to become more concern driven, like looking at new Bauhaus uh, in Europe. Um, however, it 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 
sounds like it's far from uh, the synthetic biology or human-animal relations we have been addressing in this project, for, uh, among others. Um, yet at the same time, this concern-driven uh, approach may give us uh, uh, more um, opportunities to set these forth, maybe more in a really project-oriented context. Marta, what would be your follow-up project if you were to join a project as Hybrid Lab no Network again? Um, <coughs> I have been uh, challenged uh, a lot by the, the, particularly the artistic field. Um, that's something that really um, impact me. So um, as a follow up, I would like, just a little bit like Jose told that, um, to explore that impact of uh, the artistic uh, um, toolkit, if you, if you want, the, the artistic uh, uh, tools that uh, people from the, the artistic field have, uh, and, and to learn more, to incorporate them more into <clears throat> the scientific uh, create creative what we uh, create our scientific creative uh, process. How can we do it? No, I don't know. <laughs> but it's um, it, and and to transform that later on on a, on a, so I do I, I also uh, teach uh, uh, at university so to transform that ultimately into a course. In the, in the in the university. Yeah, yeah thank you. That that, that um, uh, I think there and and it looks a little bit like we are um, making conclusions before the rest of this uh, uh, these two these days go on. So I think we will uh, learn a lot more. Uh, but it's already interesting to see a very uh, uh, um, sort of pro project orientedness making laboratories where um, both sides, uh, the arts and sciences, the arts and engineering, uh, are challenging uh, each other's in preconceptions of biology, preconceptions of uh, maybe also the, the way uh, certain techniques in biotechnology are experienced by a broader audience, uh, etc. And that, that maybe also goes to, to this idea that uh, Polona in the earlier session brought in, how to deal with STEAM in a broad sense and to, to define STEAM more or to, to work with uh, these interactions between uh, arts, engineering, technology, science in a more project-oriented uh, um, fashion which of course um, uh, is done at these very small laboratories uh, that we sometimes meet in uh, academic context, in an art school context, also in Ljubljana uh, Biotechna of uh, Kersenkova, where Polona is also uh, pretty close to, and the, the very tiny lab we have at Bach. Um, Time-wise, I want to thank you for sharing these uh, experiences, and I hope they are also uh, um, um, inspiring to you and to the rest of the two days we spent together. So thank you. <laughs>